participants on the call, including you. You are joining your conference as a participant. For a menu of available commands, press star pound. Good evening and welcome to the FEMA Region 2 Individual and Community Preparedness Webinar Series. My name is Allison Albright and I'm the Regional Preparedness Liaison for FEMA Region 2. I'm going to provide a few technical considerations before we begin. Today's proceedings are being recorded and captioned. You should hear audio through your computer speakers, so please ensure your volume is turned up so we hear the proceedings accordingly. I moved, sorry, in the, bottom, in the bottom of your screen, you'll receive the news and updates from Region 2. If so, please enter your email address and we'll be sure to add you to the distribution list. We will have question and answer session after the presentation concludes. You'll see there's a Q&A pod in the lower right-hand corner. Please feel free to submit your questions about the subject matter there, and time permitting, we'll do our best to answer them. Finally, the PowerPoint presentation from today will be available for you to download in the file share pod as a PDF. Click on the file and download it using the download button. Dad, I'd like to turn it over to the Region 2 Community Preparedness Officer to introduce our speaker and today's Good afternoon, everyone. Did you know that FEMA's number one goal in our strategic plan is to build a culture of preparedness? The Region 2 Individual and Community Preparedness Program is focused on preparing individuals and communities for disasters by providing useful information and training, inspiring people to act and be ready for any emergency. I'm Debbie Costa, the Community Preparedness Officer for FEMA Region 2. On behalf of our team working to strengthen preparedness across New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, I'd like to welcome you to our preparedness webinar series. I'm pleased to be hosting today's webinar for CERFs on how to plan and facilitate a tabletop exercise. Our presenter today is Raquel Solon. As FEI Workforce Resilience Business Solutions Engineer, Raquel is responsible for helping organizations within a wide range of industry, including retail, higher ed, healthcare, mental health, and human services, as well as general business and manufacturing, determine and implement a holistic crisis management system. Raquel is also responsible for the delivery of workplace violence prevention, leadership development, and crisis management training. She is experienced in reviewing current training and policies and procedures to identify gaps and work with clients towards a solution. Raquel, I'll turn the floor over to you. All right, thank you, Debbie, or er, Deb, sorry. <laughs> I decided to give you a new short name. Um, welcome everybody to the session today about tabletop exercises. You are um, going to need to practice a little bit of forgiveness with me as I'm working off of two big screens so that I can see all of the activity that's going on um, in the session today. So from a standpoint of ground rules, there is going to be some time for you to have some discussion, some opportunity to engage. Um, if you've been in the sessions before uh, you, and if you've had me before, then you know that we do like to engage with each other. So um, we're going to have some ground rules. The first is what happens in the training room stays in the training room. That just helps to establish some safety um, for people to be able to free, be free in participating, as well as understanding that we all come together with different thoughts, ideas, opinions, experiences, backgrounds, life histories. So we are going to respect each other's thoughts um, and be respectful throughout that engagement. Tangents um, can be and are good distractions as long as they circle back to the training material. So um, you're going to get out of it what you put into it, uh, as is always the case when I'm with you. And so I would just ask that you do share, and your group is um, very typically fantastic at doing that. So I appreciate that. Um, there is the parking lot for questions, as Deb mentioned. Um, so go ahead and feel free to do that. I will also try to watch the chat and um, look at uh, questions as they come in as well. Um, but if I happen to miss one, uh, feel free to just let me know. 
And in the meantime, we're going to sit back, relax, and enjoy yourself. But don't get too comfortable because, like I said, we are going to ask you to participate. So let's go ahead and review the objectives. So we are going to um, discuss the uh, HSEEP uh, overview, and that is the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program. Um, we are not going to deep dive into that. I believe it's like a 79-page manual, um, but we are going to give um, an overview because you'll want to have some understanding from a facilitation dynamic. Um, we are going to heavily focus on design and development as well as the exercise setup practical application is where we're going to spend a good portion of our time and then review. So as we are moving along, those are our objectives for today. As you know, if you've been in my sessions before, you know we're going to start everything with a pretest. The pretest really isn't a test. It's just to start getting our noodles working after a long day of doing other jobs. So um, get us start thinking about our CERT teams. So here we go. Exercises, and you're going to chat in the chat feature, which I see you're all very familiar with, typing in your names and your locations and your teams, so your areas. Um, if you see me looking up and over, like I said, I'm working off of two screens. I'm not trying to not give you eye contact. I'm just trying to make sure I stay engaged with what's going on in the room as well. So. Exercises are va a valuable tool to assist with preparedness, response, and recovery. True or false? I've got a true coming in. Thank you, Beth, for that. True, Catherine. True, Lisa. True, Frank. True, Danielle. True, John. True, Mary. True, Edward. True, Renato. All right, so some more people are typing. As you know, you can see that in there. Multiple people are typing. We'll wait for that to um, fall into place. Lots of more, couple more trues coming in. All right, so I'll come back to those as you're typing. True indeed. That's right, Terry. True indeed. All right, so Vito says true. Stan says true. Sharice says true. Sal says true. All right, thank you so much for participating in that. Um, the answer is true. It is a valuable tool that we can assist in all the different aspects of preparedness, response, and recovery. So um, it's important that we think about them, develop them, design them, and have some meaning behind them as we go through. Thank you for the other truths that popped in, Bernadette and uh, JICU. All right, so what is the best scenario to drill in a tabletop exercise? What do you think? What is the best scenario to drill in a tabletop exercise? And this one is going to take a moment, possibly, for you to type in. So I'm going to wait. All right, non-operational, OK? Um, communication. Yeah, I like both of those. So Frank, give me an example of non-operational. You can add a little bit to that one for me while other people are also typing in. Lots of people typing in. <clears throat> so discussion, not hands-on with tools. OK, good. Um, Mary, something that's applicable to your area and organization. Okay, good. Shelter management, nice. Team building, such as problem solving. Yep. All right, good. I have lots of people typing in. I see the names fluttering about on that chat box. So. I'll give you guys just a moment to finish typing those in before we go to the next question. Scenario based. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Local disasters. Good. Thank you for that one. An event that would actually and probably happen in your area. Nice. Radio training. Good. Good. All right. I see one more person typing in, and then I'm going to go to the next question. So I want to ex acknowledge that. Thank you, Edward. Group exercise. All right, nice. OK, so um, <clears throat> I don't have a specific best scenario to drill in a tabletop exercise. Um, we're going to talk about best practice um, perspectives on doing a tabletop exercise, because a tabletop can range from being simple to being complex. 
Um, you're going to have a wide variety of players who could um, participate in it. Um, it might be um, looking at and validating plans and procedures and types of systems that you need in place, making sure and doing a gap analysis to identify weaknesses. So there's not a per se best, but all of those answers can fill in, and you can do exercises around them. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, the next question as we go into our pretest is, the most important element of designing the exercise is the scenario development. True or false? What do you think? The most important element of designing the exercise is the scenario development. True or false? EEG is the most important. False? The index. Okay. Got a couple more people typing in. So I see I have my scrunchy face when I'm trying to read that screen. I'm sorry. They're not they're not not good answers. I'm just reading so I can see I'm scrunchy face in it. And I'll have to in our communication training that we did, I'll have to make sure I'm monitoring my nonverbal communication. All right. So we have false, 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 more falses coming in. All right. So I've got a true that came in. Um, all right, I think. Yep, OK. All right, so a couple not in the regular chat, just to me, and that's OK. So another false came in. All right, so we would say, and we would really argue, um, especially as you're looking at um, developing tabletop exercises, um, that we would say it is actually false that the facilitation of the dialogue, um, who does what, when, where, how, et cetera, um, is really what is going to be the most important. Not just the scenario, but answering the what-if questions, facilitating that discussion, facilitating the learning process, helping people to engage, um, helping people to feel comfortable to have that lively discussion um, so they can figure out those who, what, when, where, how questions and do that gap analysis. So that facilitation role is very important. Um, the scenario is important and you want to practice things, but being able to manage that group and facilitate that discussion um, is key as well. All right, so let's go ahead and go to the last question. <clears throat> so what's the facilitator's main responsibility in a training exercise? Oh, man, I just gave you the answer. All right, so <laughs> we'll see who was listening on that one. Um, <laughs> we've got facilitate coming in. Yep. All right. <clears throat> guess I should have um, not had the questions come in singly so that I could see them coming in. Enable the discussion. All right, facilitate that discussion. So facilitate, enable the discussion, yes. Um, participation by all, I like that, um, Kennedy. Uh, driving the discussion and learning process. The main skill is being a good listener, nice. To enhance communication between participants, being the coordinator and the mediator, to engage. Very good. All right. Um, I apologize. I've got to get my mouse back over on the other screen. Here we go. Come on. I do apologize for those of you who've been with me before. Um, you can chat in the type chat box so I know who's a repeat. Um, you know that technology is not my strong point, so I do apologize for that. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and um, get into the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program. Um, so as we are looking at this, uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, created this model for consistency purposes. And the intent of the model is to be flexible, scalable, and adaptable. So it has to be flexible. Um, it cannot be so specific a scenario that um, you're really getting into the weeds of the details per se, but really uh, based on your community and your risks, what your team is going to go through. Um, there are injects, and somebody mentioned that up in the um, chat box. Thank you for that, Frank. I appreciate it. Um, so there are injects so that the situation feels more fluid versus 
static. Um, when things are static, it can get stagnant. It doesn't allow for creativity and um, thought processes and those neurons to start firing. Um, now, uh, it's not every time that there's an event that we do X, Y, Z. That's not what the purpose is. So, um, <clears throat> you know, the idea is to have a mindset of, of adaptation based on other aspects and anomalies that may occur in the situation that you've prepared for. Um, additionally, your role may change, um, which gives you the opportunity then to engage in different ways as you are going through um, the scenario. So really, it's meant to be a guiding model um, so that you have the freedom and ability to create within the construct. Um, and it gives you a consistent approach so that you have a methodology to follow, which makes it a little bit easier to have that outline, and then you fill it in with the details. Um, you also want to walk away with lessons learned. So that is something that is going to be very important as well. And so as we look at, sorry, next, here we go. Um, <clears throat> as we look at the roles of an exercise, um, exercises play a vital role in the preparedness um, component as we practice. Practice makes um, perfect is one thing. Um, and as you go through, you, you learn things. You be, it becomes more fluid. It becomes um, more rote from memory. You've been through this scenario before. So um, practice really helps. Uh, in that when you practice and you create scenarios and you practice and think about the what if, you start to what is called in brain science um, creating those connections. So that which fires wires is a saying in the brain science community. And it means when you do something one time, before there was no path. And now when you've done something once, you've created this neuron path um, and it's got these little I don't know what to call them, phalanges isn't right because that's your fingers, um, but it's got these little ends that look like your fingers and it creates a path. And so now your brain has done it once and it's easier to do it again. And the more you do it, the more you practice, um, then the easier that becomes. So a well-designed exercise um, also provides some low-risk environment in order to help familiarize your teams with their roles, their responsibilities, um, you want to foster meaningful interaction throughout the exercise as well as good communication. So good communication, communication was put up in the chat box before um, as an important component, and it is. Uh, you want to assess and validate the plans, the policies, the procedures, the capabilities that you have on your team. You're looking for areas of strength and also areas of improvement. Um, there's any, everybody can improve on something. Uh, every time I do a training or sit in a training, I'm learning. Um, <clears throat> so there's always areas for improvement. Exercises bring together and strengthen the whole community and can do that to prevent and protect and mitigate against um, situations. You can um, practice responding to and recovering from all hazards. Overall, um, the exercises help communities address and identify priorities, um, as well as evaluate the progress toward meeting your preparedness goals. So you do want to have those incremental learning components where you're getting better. And again, that's why exercising and practicing and tabletops can help facilitate and pull that all together. So it looks like I switched slides. I don't know when I did that. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> I'm working off of two screens here. I do apologize. All right, so going into the... Um, Integrated preparedness cycle. The Homeland Security views exercises as part of that integrated preparedness cycle. So you're going to organize and equip. So organize and equip people with their roles, checklists, plans, tools, and knowledge. So organizing and equip is you give somebody on your team the fire extinguisher and the user manual. So um, and their job is to utilize the fire extinguisher. So you have organized that um, and equipped them for it. 
now you're going to train them. So once they have the fire extinguisher and they have the manual, you're going to train them on how to use the fire extinguisher. And then you're going to practice, so exercise. Uh, that is where you pretend the what-if scenario. So you're going out there, what if there's a fire? I'm going to engage in utilizing my fire extinguisher. And then evaluate and approve. So that's where you're figuring out gaps, if there was any timing issues, um, if there was any other resources needed, if there was um, clear communication that happened on when to utilize that fire extinguisher. Um, and then plan is making changes to the plan as identified through that um, process. And then it's circular, so you do it again. Go ahead and get my mouse on the right slide here, screen. Here we go. All right, so different types of exercises. As we look at types of exercises, um, <clears throat> there are basically two different brackets. One is discussion-based, and we have seminars. Uh, you have been through a couple maybe of seminars. I like to consider them more like workshops. Um, you can also do games. Uh, exercises in game format is fun. Make sure that whatever game you decide to put out has purpose and meaning to what the learning objectives are that you want people to walk away from. Um, and we talk about that in the team building training that we did as well. It's great to do activities and it's great to do games, but they need to have meaning and purpose behind them so that people walk away with that learning. Um, and discussion based ends up and rounds out with the tabletop, which is where we're going to focus today. Operationally based, some of you mentioned that over in the chat. Um, there is drills, those functional exercises, and then you can do a full-scale um, event um, practice. So. <clears throat> and so as we look at the tabletop, the purpose, um, there are things you're going to need to determine prior to um, designing your own tabletop on your team. So what do you want to see? What is it that you want to happen? What do you want your people to walk away with? So those are key questions. They talk about the purpose, the goals. Um, you know, the conduct characteristics are important. How are we going to engage? What outcome is it that we're looking for? What is the goal? So at the end of the day, people know their role and understand responsibilities and what's going to happen. What ideas, suggestions, practices, results are going to come out of the exercise that we participate in, that tabletop component. So I said we're going to spend the lion's share um, in – design and development, and we are, because we are going to um, part of the lion's share, I should say, because actually I think the bigger lion's share will be in the practical application. Um, but we we'll want to take time to talk about design and development, because um, it is critical to success. And as you are formulating these tabletop exercises on your team, and as this becomes part of your train the trainer component, um, you want to be able to facilitate this well. So the first thing is setting the foundation. So the exercise foundation is a set of components that drive the design and development process. So you want to consider priorities um, that are integrated from the preparedness cycle. Um, and some of the priorities and things that you'll also want to consider are your um, leadership's guidance, um, any relevant after-action reports and improvement plans from real-world incidents and exercises, um, that you want to engage in from a practice standpoint for your team. Program reports from exercise managers that you have access to, and then identified risks, threats, and hazards so that you know what it is you're going to be looking to um, move the needle on. From an initial plan planning standpoint, we are looking at the when, where, who, how, what, and determine any additional planning meetings and partners that you'll need to take going forward. As we look at the risks um, from a standpoint, sorry, as we look at the risks, as we look at the scenario planning, you want to review the risks and the hazards to determine the scenario and which one is going to best fit your team's ability to respond. Um, when scenario planning, you'll also want to look at any existing plans, any policies, any procedures, 
you're going to review the scenario factors um, that your tabletop exercise builds and sustains your CERT team um, for their capabilities and within their jurisdictions. So what are the roles and responsibilities that you have? Because that can differ depending on where you are. And then, of course, you're going to look at scope. <clears throat> and so determining the exercise scope enables planners to right size the exercise to meet the objectives while staying within your resources and your personnel constraints that you have. Um, exercises are not and should not be a one size fits all um, because different areas and communities and teams have different resources um, and objectives that they are going to facilitate. Um, speaking of that, then, based on your CERT team leadership, um, you're going to figure out what is the purpose of the exercise and what you hope to accomplish. Those are the objectives. Um, the, priori the priorities are going to drive um, the development of your objectives. Objectives should consider and incorporate the intent, the plans, the policies, procedures, environment, um, also, though, corrective actions from prior exercises that you've conducted, any real-world incidents that you are going to want to incorporate, um, and then what are the desired outcomes. So there should be learning objectives as well, walkaways, takeaways. And then documentation. So whew, documentation. Anybody know the old adage? If you don't document it, it what? Well, I'll give you a second to type that in. I see multiple people typing in. It didn't happen. It doesn't exist, right? Exactly. So documentation needs to occur. Um, the other thing that documentation does is it allows you to see the needle moving, to see the progress, to see the development. Um, it also allows you to plan more effectively for the next exercise because you're going to be able to document and see your areas of strength and, and opportunities um, or for even for the next real world event. Um, without capturing that information, you're not going to be able to see what progress is being made um, as well as any patterns that you might see. So uh, make sure that you do document. And I'm glad that you all got the right answer on that pop quiz question. So good job. All right, and then you're looking at evaluation. So as you're evaluating the exercise, there's a reason why geese fly in formation. And there's also a reason why we evaluate processes and outcomes of tabletop exercises. And we want to learn how to fly in a better formation so that our teams respond and understand their roles. They know um, when you know, they need to step in into that role and capability or they need to move back into a different spot. So there's that flexibility, there's that adaptation adaptability. I can't say that word. Sorry about that. Um, but, you know, you know what the purpose is. Um, and through evaluation, you can figure out, again, where people might need a little bit more training, a little bit more encouragement, a little bit more building up, um, and then maybe a little bit more understanding about um, their roles and responsibilities. So let's get into the um, meat and potatoes part, and that is the tabletop exercise sampler. So <clears throat> the rules of the road. As you are um, looking at tabletop development, um, this is an opportunity for us to grow. Um, it's not an opportunity and shouldn't be used um, as a place to identify people who make mistakes. It's not to criticize people who go outside of the established plan. Um, one of the things that um, is probably, I don't know if it's your pet peeve, it's one of mine, um, you know, but we've always done it that way or this way, that statement. Um, I've been fighting that statement for about 25 years because just because it's always been done that way doesn't mean necessarily that it's the most efficient, the safest, the best practice. Um, that things haven't moved and changed um, as we learn and develop and grow, right? So um, I'm going to ask you some questions in just a minute. Um, but first, 
um, so that you're ready for the chat box, which you guys always are. Um, but what you're also going to do when you are doing tabletop exercises and getting that um, scenario based uh, established is you're going to use the knowledge and information available um, to you with your group. So it's important to rely on those 13 members. Each person brings um, valuable insights and perspectives um, to the team. They have different backgrounds, different experiences, different insights um, that they can help the team creative, creatively and collaboratively grow and develop. So, as you're getting into the exercise itself, and you are a facilitator now, um, what is active thinking? So explain to me what active thinking is. And active thinking is what needs to happen and should happen during the tabletop exercise. So I'm also establishing some rules of the road of what's going to happen here in just a minute, but this is also something you want to establish with your groups that there is active thinking going on. It involves metacognition. All right. I like that. And lots of people typing in. <clears throat> Viewing the global picture. Nice. Practice mindfulness. Mm -hmm. A stream of consciousness. Good. I like that. We've got a couple more people typing in, so we've got time to um, let that come in. Verbal communication, participation, good. Um, prob looking at the problem, view the problem, sorry, from multiple perspectives. My brain wanted to switch that word. Um, it's not about who has the right answer. It's about allowing them to think through the situation. That's right. Good. I like those. Good. So active thinking. Active thinking is a form of critical thinking. Um, it is analyzing the information that is being projected to the individual by the external stimuli. Um, and that active thinking then is basically um, the thought process that we use to solve a new problem or the problem that's placed in front of us. Whereas passive thinking is more along the lines of um, acting out a set um, already predetermined thoughts and actions learned through previous action. Um, so your tabletop exercises want to engage in active thinking. You want people to be um, firing off some new neurons and creating new pathways. Um, <clears throat> we know right away which one is harder and which one's easier. Um, it's always easier to do something always the same way. That's why you get that rebuttal of, you know, but we've always done it this way. Um, and that's because that's easier. But engaging in active thinking, um, again, we're going to be utilizing that critical thinking component of our brains. Um, and I do like looking at that from different multiple perspectives. Ooh, environmental thinking. Thank you for that. That popped in. Um, and the, it's not always about the right answer. It's about allowing people to think through that, getting their um, that stream of consciousness, that big picture view So that you all said. All right, so the next one, what is active listening? Active listening. I see lots of people typing in. I realize I'm going to either have to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to fill the void here while y'all are typing in. So some of you have seen me before, uh, <clears throat> but I realize from my introduction picture, I'm going to have to maybe uh, rethink my COVID hair. I've got COVID hair going on here. Um, <clears throat> all right. So say it back in new words. Um, paying attention. Sorry, Lisa, didn't mean to miss you there. Um, perception plus analysis plus knowledge mapping. Oh, I like that. Being open-minded. Actively listening is open-minded. Okay, good. Taking notes. Considering all communication with an open mind. Understanding the meaning behind what is being said. Nice. I like all of those. Concentrate. Yes. So I've got another person or two typing in. I'm going to wait and tell you what um, my answer of active listening is. And if you've been with me through the effective communication, then you will um, maybe have a reminder of that. 
listening attentively. Thank you for that. Absorbing and not judging others. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm going to give you a short, I don't know if it's an acronym or an acoustic. I forget the word. There's a word for it. Um, don't zone out. That's right. Um, for this that I'm going to tell you. But when you are actively listening and you want people to actively listen, um, I set up some um, ideas and some ground rules or I try to give people a friendly hint on how to remember active listening. And so I am going to type that in the chat. And that is we are going to be so real with people. So I'm going to be so real when I am actively listening. And you, again, some of you might, that might be a reminder if you've gone through the other training. But when I am being so real with you and I am actively listening to you, I am showing interest. Um, so I'm paying attention. I'm focusing. Somebody said that earlier, con or something similar, concentrating. So I am concentrating. I'm listening. I'm focused on you. I'm, I'm showing interest. Um, o stands for observe. Um, and support, but I'm going to observe what's going on. I'm going to observe my environment. I'm going to observe what you're saying. I'm going to observe how you're saying it. Um, I'm going to support what's being said. So observe and support. R the R stands for um, relax. Sorry. Ah. Um, so relax. If you're tense, in your active listening, it's going to tense people up and they're not going to be able to communicate as well. So you want to relax. E is empathize. You're going to empathize with that person. You're going to A, accept and respect their perspective, opinion, or feelings, whatever it is. Accept and respect. So um, some of you said, I think, being open-minded, that's where that accept and respect comes in, uh, that we all have different backgrounds, different perceptions, different education, different environments, et cetera. So I'm going to accept and respect this is what you think. This is your um, opinion. This is your experience. This is your feeling, whatever it is. And then L stands for let them talk. It's called active listening, not active talking. So you're going to let them talk. So that's my little um, hint for you on active listening. I do uh, refer back to that. I do a four-day training program, a couple different four-day training programs where I'm training trainers. Um, and we talk about actively listening um, <clears throat> and setting up some ground rules for that so that people have a chance to engage and participate. So you want people to be able to um, participate and through that as a facilitator I'm going to actively listen to you um, but with each other and some group roles it's, a, it's nice to establish that we're going to actively listen to each other as well and then active participation so what is active participation what does that mean active participation I'm going to let y'all chat that in and See if I can get my mouse in the right spot here. All right. So active participation is staying engaged, being present in the interaction. I like that. Contributing, getting your hands dirty, being involved, involvement, contributing valid content to the discussion, um, interaction, contributing your views. Paraphrasing, okay, to comment and to be active during the webinar. <laughs> That's right. During our webinar, I want you to comment and be active. That is, that is a good ground rule to establish. Thank you for that. Um, to the, this chat box is active participation. That's right. So there's different, and I'm glad you pointed that out, Frank and Renato, um, both of you, that you are actively participating right now. So it's through the chat box. Um, and you are engaged. So active participation is um, the consistent and um, simultaneous engagement of the minds. Um, it is where the learners um, are able to absorb the content. Um, participation increases the rate and degree of learning. So that is why Raquel likes to ask you lots of questions and get you engaged, because I know that the more you participate, then the more likely 
you are to walk away with something. It's not a guarantee, but um, the more likely you are. And then the other thing you're going to have, again, um, you've heard this before. You heard it when we established our ground rules, but also respect um, that it's okay that we challenge an idea, um, but not the person itself. Um, we don't, you don't want to um, dig, dig, digress, that is the word, sorry, um, digress into personal attacks or personalization. Um, you know, or, you know, what are you thinking sort of language. That's you language. That's attacking. Um, but instead, you want to work out and find ways to work through an idea that um, you can negotiate through the pros and cons um, or the strengths or weaknesses, figure out the advantages or disadvantages of an idea and what's going to work best for the group. So. That's right. Um, active participation does keep the juices flowing for sure. Um, and so does respect. So I'm not sure when that came in, Judy, but I'm going to apply that to both, actually. Um, and then, of course, you want a reality check. So you want to make the exercise applicable for you. So in your activity, you're going to have um, an agenda. So you're going to have some introductions with whoever is engaged in the tabletop scenario. Um, there, um, uh, you're gonna be, you're gonna set the scenario, set the stage. There will be a description. We're gonna do a hot wash or slash a debriefing, um, component and then action planning. There should be action planning that comes of this. So there may be people in the exercise and on your teams who don't necessarily have any responsibility, but that you're, so for instance, um, you know, if you're in charge of getting furniture for an emergency operations center, um, you might not have a role in a virtual setting. Um, so think about how you're going to utilize those skill sets and where you're going to rearrange your resources. So again, it's about um, figuring out and being flexible what's going to happen. Um, the function, see if I can get my other screen to move. All right, so. The function of a tabletop exercise, um, how does it work? Um, of course, it's scenario-based. It's guided by the facilitator. So I am your guide. I am helping facilitate. I am not the end-all, know-all, be-all person. And that is not the role of the facilitator. It's not to have all of the right answers. It's to rely on your team to help them come to good or better or maybe even best answers and processes and figuring things out. So it's a scenario-based discussion guided by a facilitator. The problems are talked through without stress. These are not utilized to be a gotcha moment where we see, you know, how much somebody retained from an online learning they did six weeks ago or something. Um, that's not what we want to do. The problems are talked through without stress um, to engage in that creative dialogue and figure out how we're going to um, respond better in future events. Evaluators are going to be selected to observe and offer feedback. Um, and then policies, plans, and guidelines are updated because it's a learning process. It's something that we're able to work through. It's something that we are able to um, change then our plans, policies, and procedures. Sorry, here comes my mouth. OK. So how do you know your success? You're successful. Um, a successful tabletop leaves participants with a positive learning experience. You want there to be a positive learning experience. Um, you want people to feel that they contributed, that they are validated. Um, <clears throat> I hope over the course of the last, I think we're on ses session six, um, so today included, over the six sessions that we've been together, um, I hope that I have role modeled how to engage in a positive learning experience. Um, through that, um, again, we don't criticize responses and answers. You are acknowledging people. You're using their words. Um, I'm looking up at the chat box again, sorry, um, <laughs> so that you can help people feel like they can participate and that they are a valuable contributor. Um, that there is organizational learning that has occurred, that your team, your organization is your team. 
so your team has learned and can do things better going forward, um, that there are improvement action plans. So you're leaving with to-do lists. Well, how are, what are we going to do next? This is how we can become even better. Um, that there are more effective policies or plans and guidelines that are established through that. Um, and that overall, the goal is that you have improved preparedness. So again, um, you want to walk away with lots of to-dos, that's a good thing, walking away with lots of to-dos. It's don't view that as, oh man, you know, we've got so much work to do, we must not be doing things well. No, that means that you had a really good tabletop learning experience, um, having lots of to-dos that you can put into place when you go um, and then change your, change your plans up or review with leadership if they aren't there. All right, so practical application. We're getting into um, the practical application component. So we are going to give you this demographic overview. Um, I will read it, but it's also on your screen. And so you are um, in any town, and any town is a small city with a population of 100,000 residents. Um, the city is accessed by multiple bridges, and there is a small public safety presence that increases during tourist season. Any town is planning for a major event this weekend to open up the season. So this is where we are right now. Um, I understand that your team um, may also come from other cities, so keep that in mind. But let's say for the sake of this scenario that we're going to practice through, that all of you live within 20 minutes of any town to be able to respond. Okay? So get events insurance. <laughs> All right, save that for your breakout session. All right, so we are going to um, go into breakout sessions in just a moment, um, and I will keep up the slides, but I'm going to tell you that we're going to ask a couple of questions from the breakout session if, oh my goodness, Raquel, if I can um, go ahead and move these. So the questions we're going to ask, ah, I should have put them in after each um, inject. Uh, so the questions we're going to ask and what I want you to ask in your breakout sessions as well is what precautionary measures are put in place and who is going to be involved? What are your roles? What are you going to do? What needs to happen, et cetera? So our first inject to this scenario is it's 12.01 p.m. It's not an inject, sorry. This is the scenario narrative. I apologize. It's 12.01 p.m. The city council is convening to discuss the final logistics for the upcoming event this weekend. The National Weather Service has just issued a severe thunderstorm weather warning, and people are beginning to come into the area, so traffic is getting dense on the bridges in the city. So Allison has possibly pre-assigned you to some breakout groups, but otherwise we're going to go into breakout groups right now, and I'm going to put those questions um, on the board. So what you're going to do is you're going to figure out where we're at, what's going to happen, what needs to happen at this moment, um, what are your roles. So your questions that you're going to ask is what precautionary measures do you have or do you need to put in place and who's going to be involved in that. But Allison, I'm going to have you go ahead and put us into those breakout sessions. Great. And then I'll check. There we go. Yes, so I'm going to um, move everyone to a breakout room in just a second, and we're also going to enable your mic so you can talk to your group mates. And um, you should see in the top of the screen there is um, a phone icon, and by clicking on that, you can actually enable um, your microphone. Um, same with the speaker icon. You want to make sure that the speaker is on so you can hear what everyone is saying. Um, we also have a camera icon that you'll see once you go into the breakout rooms, and there's a button that says start your webcam, and then you'll be able to share your webcam. There will also be a notepad in each breakout room for you to take notes, and we can share that for you um, when you have your report outs as well. If you have any and, questions, and so, um, I'll be here to answer them. Thank you, Allison. And so before we, did, before we do that, thank you, that did remind me. So there will need, I will want to have a primary speaker in each of the breakout sessions. Um, and it, as Allison mentioned, there's going to be a notepad um, so that you can rely on your notes and or we can put them up. And for this first scenario, what you're doing is you're establishing, you're establishing your team. 
Um, I know y'all are already on different teams, but your breakout may be in, encompassing people from other areas. So you're going to figure out um, who's involved, what precautionary measures you should have in place for right now, okay? So, and we're going to have about eight minutes for this first, just the scenario narrative. It'll give you a little bit longer when we're working through the NJEX. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking, and Allison, you can go ahead and do the breakout if you didn't already. No, but I was typing and, and it didn't let us type. There. Let's see. I can probably turn your mic on. It looks like breakout one. I've got Anthony. I didn't know. Is Jay part of? Yeah, you got me now. Jay, can you hear me? I, I don't know. Bernadette, I can hear you. I know, but we it seems I, like I we lost our breakout room. Uh, yeah, lost yep, the breakout you did. room. I kicked out. Time was up. Okay. Uh, oh, but you lost your notes. There's no notes. What happened to all the notes? All right. Let's see if Allison can bring them up for us. She is. She's bringing up the notes. There were right. more notes than that for breakout room one. Oh, you gotta love technology, right? Everybody, you're all feeling my pain with this one. <laughs> I had pain just trying to get in because this is my first time using oh. the FEMA thing. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, I feel you. All right. Um, yep. So yes. Go ahead, Anthony. No, I'm fine. I can oh, hear you. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, so I don't know if anybody has. Um, so breakout one. It looks like we didn't. Maybe you guys wrote it probably on your whiteboard. Um, and I don't know if Allison can grab that. And I'll go to breakout two and see if Allison can grab the whiteboard or not. Um, yeah. Or Allison, if you the whiteboard me. may oh, not. Okay. The way the whiteboard may not show up, but I will try to see what I can do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, or what it, where their notes went, because I know that they were, there were some notes in each breakout session as I was checking them. So I'm going to go ahead and go to breakout session number two while Allison's doing that. Um, anybody want to unmute yourself and feel free to take the helm and do a synopsis of your dialogue? I see Lisa is unmuted, Stephen, Vito, any of you all? I can unmute Lawrence and Regina if you want me to, or somebody. I can start. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, it looked like most of us were typing. There wasn't any verbal communication going on. At least I wasn't able to hear anyone. But um, <clears throat> one, of, one of the things that um, I had put on the whiteboard, and I think it's sort of consistent with what you see here on the notes from everyone, <clears throat> is that you really have to put together an, an IAP, an incident action plan, um, initially to determine, um, you know, what the impacts are going to be to the community. And, uh, you know, as we all see it, or as I see it as well, too, the, um, the influx of people into the community, certainly um, the weather report impact, uh, probably the most critical uh, item that, you know, has to be watched. And uh, while the notes stated that the city council was going to be meeting to discuss the event uh, for the upcoming weekend, it sort of didn't give a timing as to when their meeting was. But, um, you know, potentially with the, with the storm hazard, uh, you know, maybe the governing body has to look at possibly uh, changing the date, maybe deciding on a, a delayed event, a weather, you know, a weather uh, uh, date change. 
uh, initially um, as part of this event. I guess I got to unmute myself. Good. I appreciate that synopsis. Thank you. <clears throat> um, breakout session number three. Do you guys have anything? Um, oh, it looks like. There are. Um, it looks like in your group. Mary, Renato, and Velma are unmuted. I don't know if you'll be able to speak or not, if we can hear you, if you have a speaker engaged. Oh, there you go, Frank. You're unmuted now, too. So um, I don't know if you designated a spokesperson. If not, um, somebody can take one. Okay. Well, I did a, a lot of the typing here, <laughs> but I think I saw it. And, and Velma trying to say things, and Renato did some typing too. So I'll just say here on the, on the top here uh, that you probably the first thing is you need to know the number of people attending and where they can take refuge from the storm if it arrives. And then uh, you need to have some type of crowd control plan to move people. Uh, and you might have to have equipment like cars or golf carts because there's always going to be some people who can't move quickly enough, uh, ignore the next thing. That's just some local law in New York City. Uh, and you need to have uh, uh, cars and uh, emergency uh, response equipment on both sides of the bridge. Uh, that actually has happened to us. Um, and uh, you need to uh, control the flow of traffic on the bridges so you have room for emergency vehicles, uh, so you have a spare lane or something like that. I think John had something to say. I saw him speaking, but it didn't come out. And then Renato was typing in Velma at something. So John? Unmute, John. Um, it, the thing I was mentioning was it, it, even before the event, you want to know what your location of your first traffic control, et cetera. So whatever planning meetings that happen before the event are key to responding as something develops down the line. Your personnel, any volunteer personnel, who the organizers are and things like that, that should be known from before. OK. Great. And then Velma? I was I really just trying, trying but um, it did cut out a teeny tiny bit. So thank you. Can I just ask I do uh, what that. breakout oh. session are we in? Velma, you are part of the three. Three. OK. And thank you. So <clears throat> all right. Um, for sake of time, we're going to go to the next yeah, inject, and so I called on two and three, so in the next breakouts, um, you may or may not get a pass, um, but we're going to go ahead and go to the um, next inject, or the inject, so that we can get moving here. I'm going to put these away. All right, Allison, thank you for helping with that. All right, so... Um, and just know that apparently, I'm not sure what's going on with the, you know, you got, I could hear a lot of you here um, in the main session. If you can't speak in the breakout room, just go ahead and use the notes section and we'll put up each of your notes um, and then share that. So, so that was at 12.01 and we have some good basis and understanding, um, um, general information that you need to have in place to gather to move forward. But at 1.30 1 p.m., NOAA notifies any town county is under a tornado warning. An F3 tornado, tornado has, has just, just numerous buildings in the town directly northeast of any town. The tornado is moving at 30 plus miles per hour in a northeasterly direction. So now what? What precautionary measures are needing to be put in place or should have been put in place? And who's going to be involved in that? So we're going to go ahead and go to your breakout sessions again. 
can chat about that amongst each other since if your microphones aren't working, we'll work around it. So Crab and Allison, are they back in the breakout sessions? I don't know how to tell. Yeah. Oh, yes, they are in the breakout sessions now. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So now, some of the breakout sessions got on different slides somehow. breakout room, the mic control disappeared, a comment said. Hmm. Great. <clears throat> so we had our inject number one, which was um, that NOAA notified any town that they are under a tornado warning. An F3 tornado had just destroyed numerous buildings in the town directly northeast of any town. The tornado is moving at 30 plus miles per hour um, in a northeasterly direction. So um, as we are looking at the um, notes, let's go ahead and um, we have I we had to skip over session um, breakout session group one last time. So if group one, if anybody wants to unmute, do you want to say your notes? I can say your notes. Um, if it's easier for y'all, what do you want to do? Um, what do you guys want to do facilitating this discussion? So we have in breakout session number one, Anthony, Jay, Kennedy, and Roy. You know, but I didn't. I didn't see my, my team. <laughs> um, there, some people were. Uh, maybe it, something else happened. I'm not sure, but I did see different people in different groups. I don't know. I didn't look at every single person, um, but I did check in and pop in a couple times with the different groups. So I'm sorry if something happened. Um. <laughs> this, this is Kennedy. Can anyone hear me? Oh. Yeah, I can hear you, Kennedy. Go ahead. Um, I, I, I made a note that I, I found it difficult to, to find what my role was in the exercise, only because I don't know of the various organizations who is responding to this this apparent terrible disaster um fire police uh, emts cert where you know what is our role that i that that was what i was struggling with sure, sure. So um, so part of that is establishing that scenario narrative, and I know we had the sound issues that took away from some of the time trying to figure out part of that. But um, as mentioned in some of the other groups, um, you want to find out, you know, who all is responding, how you're participating with them, um, what um, they're doing so that you can be support the supportive role, who and where the first responders are, et cetera. So that's a, it's a question. So. It's intentional, some of this is intentionally left vague um, in order to just facilitate dialogue and what questions you need to ask. Part of going through an exercise in tabletop is also what learning and understanding what answers you need in order to be successful. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Frank had an interesting observation that I know y'all can probably see in the chat is, is it a trick question if the tornado is moving away from the event? So um, isn't that, so part of, um, and I will tell you, 
having been um, a security executive um, with a large retailer and being responsible for the safety of the people inside my organization, as well as the guests and customers who service or who, who um, patronize, patronize? Yes, and not patronize. I don't know. You know the word I mean. Want who buy things there? Um, <laughs> I like real. I like little language. So, um, so having that responsibility, sometimes our brains like to get into that response mode, and sometimes what we need to do is to take a sit back and to analyze the information that is being put in front of us. It wasn't necessarily trying to be a trick question. It does get the juices flowing. Um, asking these questions, who do you need, what do you need to do, but if the tornado is um, in the northeast town of any town and it's moving northeast, um, then very likely we are at a situation where we are just on standby to make sure it doesn't turn back towards the town. So. Um, we have five minutes left, technically, um, unless Deb or Allison have different information. So I am going to, we're going to skip inject number two um, and go into the hot wash process Let's see. so that we can talk about this and hopefully, go ahead. Somebody, Deb or Allison? Okay, I didn't know if one of you had something to say. So hot wash is an immediate after action discussion. Um, my peers, by the way, did say that I was being over ambitious with putting in more injects into the scenario, but you never know how it's gonna go. And unfortunately, um, as I typed in a couple of your chat rooms, um, part of the technical issues just meant that we had an anomaly that came up and does everything run perfectly in a crisis? In an emergency, it doesn't. So we gotta find the workaround, right? So it's being able to problem solve and work with the tools that you have. Um, so I do appreciate all of you who had the patience and the time to type in some of those learnings in your notes. Thank you for that. Um, but a hot wash is the immediate after action discussion and evaluation um, of your performance during that exercise, training event, um, a major event, a real emergent situation. The purpose of the hot wash is to identify those strengths and weaknesses in response to a given event, which leads to another phase, which is known as lessons learned. So what did we learn? Um, and that is intended to guide then future responses in order to avoid repeating um, any of the errors that may have been made um, and to build on the strengths and um, what was done well. And so it usually includes all the parties that participated um, so that you can get a full perspective and understanding of the scope. Um, and then an after action review is um, created. So as we look at the hot wash, if I can get up to the right screen, um, we're gonna, we have two questions here that we are going to discuss. Um, and so we, I was planning on doing this in a breakout. We're not going to do that. Um, we're just going to freeform in the chat uh, because the breakouts are not being user friendly at the moment. So um, did this exercise increase your, there's a typo in there, okay. Um, did, your, did this exercise increase your awareness of um, emergency weather response? You can see that this question was carried over from a different presentation. Sorry, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes too. Um, and how, and then how will this exercise provide input for your future planning? So, and I will change those slides um, and give you a fresh copy when for your own use, for those of you who are attending and want to utilize this for training. Um, additional people, I will fix those slides, just so you know. All right. <clears throat> so did this increase, how did this, did this increase your awareness for your preparedness needs? Um, <laughs> or what you needed to think about in an emergent situation? And um, you're going to ask yourself, um, how is this going to help you in continued emergency planning operations? So now those are the questions that you're going to ask yourself in a hot wash. I want to ask you this question. There were obviously going to be different approaches to what you needed to work through. 
Did you come to a consensus in your groups? Was there any, um, just, were there any things that you disagreed on or that you did agree on? How did you come to that consensus? Um, how did you come to the decisions that you made or the information that you needed together? So it indicated the need for full situational awareness, okay? Um, I like the participants', participants questions. What roles are we playing? Good thinking. Okay, thank you. Um, good, sorry. Uh, yes, all training is good. As you stated earlier, we learn something new every time. Oh. Thanks for giving me a little bit of grace, y'all, in that. Um, so you did not have group interact, you didn't have a group. You weren't maybe assigned to a group? I thought I saw you in one, Bernda. I'm so sorry if you weren't. Um, so uh, <clears throat> good learning for next time on our part. I know that there was some pre-assignment of groups, so then we'll just use the randomizer, I think. Um, well, maybe y'all will use the randomizer for future events, since this is technically my last session with y'all for the moment. Um, Active participation. All right, so you needed to actively participate and engage, and that's something that happened. Good. Um, yep, I understand. No audio. Um, <clears throat> multiple people are typing. So as we go through, like I said, I'm going to make a note of this. Put this slide. Grab a piece of paper while you're typing. Realistic communication problems. <laughs> it was planned that way. No, it wasn't. But what if your communication systems go down? How are you going to figure things out? How are you going to communicate with your team? How are you going to enact the plans that you have, right? So you've got to have a backup plan. We've got to work around the anomalies that occur. So face-to-face, um, <clears throat> -face, that's how, yeah. yeah. That's why it was realistic. <laughs> Thanks for that grace, Frank. All right, slide 31. I need to fix that. Copy it over from a different session, obviously, on a university setting. So we'll make that applicable to um, your setting. Do apologize for that. All right, as we're going through, I see that there's more typing. Um, <clears throat> Okay. Okay, so you did some inter internal internalizing of the information and trying to think about different roles. That's great. Um, this was definitely a learning experience in communicating. That's right, it was, wasn't it? So we've got to go to plan B. Um, so plan A was that everybody was going to be verbalizing. Plan B then was typing. Now, for those of you who had video chat, maybe, maybe plan C would have been sign language, if you know that or had anybody in the group who's able to do that. All right. Um, <clears throat> all right. So we're going to go ahead and move forward. Uh, let's see here. The last, second to last slide is any questions. Any questions that you have? Um, I know that we are two minutes over time, so I do want to be respectful. Certainly, you can hang out, type in a question. Um, but this is my information. Uh, um, that's a, that is a great question, Lawrence, and I'm going to sling that one over to Deb and Allison. Is there a CERT board game um, with CERT exercises full of index? I like that. And I think that if there's not, that that would be a great thing to collaborate on to create. So. Um, I actually picked the tornado situation because it is, in researching the weather anomalies that happen, um, it's been an infrequent event for the Region 2 members. I looked at all of your different areas and infrequent or, um, you know, less common. So certainly could have done a hurricane, but everybody is pretty familiar with that. Didn't want to do old hat. So, um what is my response to the last question? So Allison and Deb, what is the response to the last question? Because I don't have the answer to that question. So. Honestly, I don't have the answer either. I haven't heard of any uh, game that currently exists. So I would 
throw it back to the participants who are on if anybody is familiar with anything like that. I have seen some emergency preparedness games for kids, um, but never one for adults uh, to the level that they're asking. That would be something really fun to create. Um, and you might be able to find a template online, because as I'm thinking about that, I do some other trainings, and there's like a Jeopardy template. You might be able to find um, a, a D and d template that you're able to utilize for those scenarios. So. In city, okay. Yep. So, and you think about that, and so you can never say never. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little tiny bit of pushback, Frank, only because um, you've been with me before, and I know that you know you're gonna take it in the intention it is. Um, so. The manager said that tornadoes don't happen in New York City because of tall buildings. Um, oh, you're saying it did. Okay, sorry. I read that wrong. Um, they said the same thing in Milwaukee um, because of the buildings and because of the lake, and we had a tornado touch down <laughs> um, in the city and caused building damage. So something that never happens, happens. So expect the unexpected, So as Monk says. Home Depot changed their procedures, yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, we've got a couple more people talk, uh, not talking, sorry, typing. So I'm going to wait to see what comes in. Um, if we have any questions or any comments, I'm certainly happy to acknowledge those. Um, Want to make sure that everybody has their voice heard. Um, wow. Twice in Brooklyn in the recent past. Oh. <clears throat> Uh, is there, hold on a second. Um, so uh, uh, I see the question um, about participant certificates that was typed in just to me, available for the session. Um, so Deb and Allison, um, I'm going to ask, uh, do, is there um, a certificate that um, gets printed out? We usually do it on our class. Okay. So I just assign that one to you so that you have access to that. So we'll go ahead and get that for you. Oh, I know V. That, is that Vito from Neptune? Well, it's Vito for sure. <laughs> he says, yeah. I know Vito. <laughs> sure. All right. um, Allison, to put our, our email up at, at the end, do you have the slide up there for our email? anybody wants a certificate, they could email us at FEMA-R2-PREPARES. And uh, once we get the, the list of everyone, we'll, we'll make up some certificates and send them out to you individually. All right, cool. Thank you for that answer, Deb. For everybody who has been with me before, it was nice to see you again virtually. Um, I do thank everyone on this session for your participation, for your patience, and for working around the um, anomaly that happened in our situation. Uh, so like was said, good practice to work around. Um, <clears throat> Look at the prior recordings if you haven't had a chance to do that. They are on your websites, and I thank you so much for participating with me. Hopefully, sometime in the future, I will be able to be with you again. Yes, thank you so much, Raquel. And that concludes, how many did we do all together? Is that six different six training modules? Yeah. Right? Yep, that and then the are the trainer. Ex, that are in mm -hmm. excess of what FEMA typically offers or, or typical CERT training. So um, these were um, courses were selected based on input we got from different CERT managers, uh, particularly in New Jersey, because the intention was originally to, to deliver it in person in New Jersey, so that we hope that you do find it useful. Um, we do have all of them archived on the FEMA Region 2 site and on the FEMA.gov site. Allison put up a, a very short three-question survey. If you all wouldn't mind taking an opportunity just to fill that out. 
Allison, you mentioned about a download pod, but I don't see anything in the download pod. So where is the PDF for today's presentation if folks wanted to download that? Just one second. Um, okay. The presentation can be downloaded, but like I said, we have an error on that one slide, so I want to fix that for you guys and get you that. So you know what? Why don't you get us the updated – oh, Allison just put it in there. I was going to say, why don't you get us the updated slide deck, and we could just email it out to everyone. Yeah, I'll email out to everyone regardless to, after the session is over. Okay. All right. Thank you. And we do have a lot of great webinars coming up. Uh, everything from healthy homes to um, a lot of the, the mitigation um, products that have been produced by Region 2. I'm excited about the Ham Radio one, active shooter guidance for disability service providers, helping kids and teens build financial capability for Financial Capability Month in April, and please don't miss Until Help Arrives. If anybody, any of the CERT volunteers, maybe are, are EMTs, this is a great program to teach. All of the materials are available online to download and teach yourself. Um, but I always think it's it's nice to see somebody do it do it in person. And Devin has done it a number of times. He is an EMT, so five very simple steps that anyone can do to save a life. We do it in two hours. So so join us for that. And then um, all of our upcoming webinars are found at the first link. Today's recording and all previous recordings could be found at the second link. If you don't already get news from Region 2, we'd love to add you to our, our email list. We send out a, a bulletin every two weeks. Once a week, we send out an announcement with all our webinars. And if you have any suggestions for uh, future webinars, send us an email at FEMA-R2Prepares. Raquel, thank you so much. It was a pleasure, and I look forward to working with you again soon. Thank you, Deb. All right, everyone.